Welcome, everyone, to another episode of the Most Notorious Podcast. I'm Eric Rivenis. So great to have you here with me. And I am very delighted to have Gavin Whitehead here as well. He is the creator and host of the Art of Crime podcast. It's a history podcast about the unlikely collisions between true crime and the arts. And he's here today to tell us all about a really fascinating murder case. Thank you so much for coming on. Thanks for having me on. So yeah, where did you hear about this case? How did it go from being an idea to a fully researched story? It's so interesting, especially its connection to Madame Tussaud. Sure. Yeah. So in a past life, I was a theater historian and I hold a doctorate essentially in theater history. And I wrote my doctoral dissertation on horror theater in London from 1794 to 1931. And I wrote four chapters, as is pretty standard for a uh, dissertation. Um, I dealt with a lot of ghost plays. Ghost plays were extremely popular throughout this kind of long 19th century that I wrote about. Um, There's a chapter about cutting edge stage technologies that were invented to represent phantoms on stage. I looked at vampire and Frankenstein plays because, as it happens, monster melodramas were extraordinarily popular in the 1820s and 30s basically a century before Dracula and Frankenstein came to the silver screen, uh, one of my chapters was also about true crime. And in this chapter, I looked at um, the kind of widespread obsession with true crime entertainment in London, starting from about 1820 to 1850. And in this chapter, I looked at plays that were written specifically to reenact real-life homicides that had recently taken place. So to give an example, in 1823, a gambler named John Thurtell murdered uh, another gamester and a solicitor, uh, William Ware, and it caused a great sensation all across the nation, really. And a playwright uh, slapped together a melodrama that faithfully reenacted the murder as it took place, and that ignited quite a controversy. Um, another murder that I talked about in that chapter was the Red Barn murder. Have you have you covered the Red Barn murder on this show? We have not, no. Okay, so I'll tell you a little bit about this one because th- there's a great detail here. So the Red Barn murder takes place in 1827. Uh, a farmer named William Quarter murders a woman named Maria Martin in a Red Barn where he bur- buries the body. The murder takes place in Suffolk, England. So after the homicide, William Quarter runs away to London and starts a new life. He gets married. He becomes the co-owner of a girls' school. So he's sort of leading a life that seems quite respectable from the outside, right? Well, almost a full year after the murder takes place, uh, the body is discovered and police track William Quarter down and bring him to justice. So afterward, the Red Barn murder becomes, uh, in the words of one of Madame Tussaud's biographers, Pauline Chapman, almost folkloric. So if you grew up in Britain in the 19th century, you knew the red the story of the Red Barn murder. It was just part of the air no matter where you lived. And it became extremely popular for playwrights to write plays about the Red Barn murder. And some version of the story held the stage for the rest of the 19th century and then well into the 20th. It just never went away. And because so many playmakers were staging and restaging and restaging this story, they would come up with different gimmicks to make their production more exciting, right? So they, they just weren't giving the, the audience the same thing over and over and over again. So my favorite example of one of these gimmicks comes in the early 1860s. So uh, the arrest of William Quarter was an iconic moment in the hunt for the killer. And William Quarter was essentially arrested while he was eating breakfast at his dining room table. And images of this arrest circulated in the press. Everyone was talking about it. People remembered it years and years, year, years and years and years later. So in the early 1860s, a troupe of performers stages a play about the Red Barn murder and they tracked down the actual constable who made the arrest. 
1828. This was happening in the 1860s. So at this point, he was like in his 70s. Interesting. And he brought him out on stage to reenact the arrest as it actually happened at the dining room table. And that was sort of the major selling point for this production. Um, wow. So yeah, I, I wrote extensively about um, true crime and theatrical entertainment. And my idea for the art of crime essentially grew out of this chapter of my dissertation. Maybe I'll say a few words quickly about this current season, because that's what we're going to talk about throughout the rest of this interview. So each season of the show is structured around a different theme. Uh, the current season is called Queen of Crime, Madame Tussaud, and the Chamber of Horrors. So basically, the season tells two stories. First, it chronicles the long and distinguished career of Madame Tussaud, kicking off in pre-revolutionary France and wrapping up in Victorian London. Each episode covers a chapter in her biography. And by the time of her death in 1850, she was an international superstar. Madame Tussaud's Wax Museum in London was it was literally the most successful tourist destination in the British capital. So she was a big deal. So I said, this season tells two stories. One of them is about Madame Tussaud. The second story is about what was called the Chamber of Horrors, which is a special showroom inside her wax museum uh, that exhibited various macabre curiosities, including effigies of notorious murderers. So just as each episode of this season advances the narrative of Tussaud's life story, each episode is also structured around a noteworthy crime or criminal depicted inside the Chamber of Horrors. And today we're going to talk about a wax effigy of the notorious murderer, Maria Manning, and her husband, George Manning. And actually some of this content comes from that chapter of my dissertation that I was talking about a minute ago as well. Very cool. Yeah. So let's start with Maria Manning, if you don't mind. Uh, she was born in Switzerland, right? Correct. Yes. So she was born in 1821, grew up in Geneva, and she lived in Switzerland for the first 22 years of her life, at which point she moved to England. And there she found employment as a lady's maid. So in this capacity, she worked for extremely wealthy families. And as a lady's maid, she would have helped her mistress do her hair in the morning, get dressed. She would have helped her keep the bedroom neat and tidy. She also would have accompanied her when her mistress traveled, things of that nature. Um, she first found employment with a woman named Lady Jane Polk. And then after that, she found employment with Lady Evelyn Blantyre. And with this job, she suddenly entered a completely new life. She entered kind of the marble halls of London, of the London elite. Um, so Lady Evelyn Blantyre was the daughter of the Duchess of Sutherland, um, who had a position at Buckingham Palace. And they were just wealthy beyond imagination. They had a property in London, not far from Buckingham Palace, called Stafford House. And because of the Duchess's status, they were constantly throwing parties and you could see luminaries from the artistic and political community communities there. And they're even said to have hosted Queen Victoria. And this will give you a good sense of just how well off they were. When Victoria first saw the magnificent Great Hall of Stafford House, she is said to have quipped oh, I've come from my house to your palace. So basically Stafford House made <laughs> Buckingham Palace look like, I don't know, some log cabin. Um, <laughs> so what's important to draw here is that Maria Manning had lived in close proximity to extraordinary wealth. As a servant, you know, she would have probably known her place within the hierarchy, which was toward the bottom. But she had lived very close to unimaginable wealth. And this will become really important to her portrayal in the media after the murder. What did she look like? How did she dress? How did she hold herself? Yes. Um, so by all accounts, she was a very beautiful young woman. She w had a fresh complexion, no blemishes except for a scar on one cheek. And she was known to dress really sharply. And this will also become fundamental to her image later on. Her favorite outfit was the black satin gown. And this carried uh, a lot of significance in Victorian England. So black satin gowns were often 
worn by middle class housewives who wanted to exude a certain kind of respectability. So, yes, she dressed really sharply. So her first real relationship was with a man named Patrick O'Connor. What was he like and what do you think attracted her to him? Sure. So in the mid-1840s, when Maria is in her mid-20s, she decides that she wants to marry. And at some point in time, she makes the acquaintance of a guy named Patrick O'Connor. We don't really know how they met, so it is kind of hard to say what attracted her to him. But it probably had something to do with money. So Patrick O'Connor was uh, a customs official. He actually worked as what was called a gauger. So what he would do is like he would measure the contents of caskets and other containers at the customs house at the London docks. In addition to that, he lent money. Now, as Maria may or may not have known, he also got involved in some illicit activities. So he was accused of usury. He was also accused of fraud. And he was also accused of facilitating the sale of contraband, including smuggled tobacco. So with all of this, he was able to live pretty comfortably. And he also had invested in the railway. So he was also making investments. He, and that's probably part of why Maria was attracted to him. And an important part of this, he did not want to get married, at least to her. Yes, correct. She was not pleased about this at all. They saw each other for quite a few years, and she desperately wanted to get married, and he just had no intention of of tying the knot, it seems. Right, right. So Maria wants to be married, and since O'Connor is not reciprocating those thoughts, that kind of commitment, she begins to look elsewhere, right? Can you talk about her next boyfriend, George Manning? what his background was, and explain their relationship together as best you can. Sure. So also in the mid-1840s, she meets George Manning, as you say. He was a guard who worked for the Great Western Railway. And again, it's uncertain when exactly they met each other and under what circumstances, but we do know that Maria Manning's first employer, Lady Jane Polk, rode the Great Western Railway on a regular basis. So it's possible that Maria met George when she was traveling on that line with Lady Jane Polk. Um, Patrick O'Connor was a bit of a shady character, right? What with the usury and fraud and smuggling. George Manning also might have been a little bit of a shady character because uh, it was basically discovered in about 1847 that over the course of a year, 4,000 pounds worth of gold bullion had been stolen from a car that George was supposed to have guarded. And his employers strongly suspected that he may have had some involvement in the crime. Maybe he facilitated this theft in some way. But it's also possible that despite these suspicions, they just did not have the evidence they needed to prosecute George. At any rate, he basically resigned from the post at that point. So there's some indication that George, like Patrick, was slightly unscrupulous. Right. So she marries George, but it doesn't mean she cuts off all contact with Patrick O'Connor. Correct. So this odd kind of love triangle emerges. She marries George and continues to see Patrick O'Connor. Um, And in fact, she would go to visit Patrick O'Connor's residence, sometimes by herself and sometimes with George present. Um, Later, once the public learned that Maria was going to visit Patrick O'Connor unaccompanied, there would be lots of rumors and speculation about a potential affair that Maria was carrying on. But definitely this love triangle created a lot of friction between Patrick and Patrick O'Connor and George Manning. Yeah, right. So 1849 is when much of this story takes place. It was a rough year in London's history. There was a cholera epidemic. 
Correct. Which was especially devastating in the neighborhood the Mannings lived in, right? Yes. So there was a ghastly cholera epidemic in 1849. So in that year, by that year, Maria and George had moved to the neighborhood of Bermondsey, which is in the south of London. It's not too far from London Bridge. And uh, it was a decidedly working class district. This is going to be important to the story later on. And life was extremely unpleasant there. Sanitation was poor. People had limited access to good drinking water. And as you mentioned, there was a terrible cholera epidemic that ravaged London in general in 1849. More than 10,000 people died that year. And uh, nearly 600 people died in Bermondsey alone. So it was the second hardest hit neighborhood in the metropolis. And so she's in this interesting situation in her life. As you said, she's worked for people who live opulent lifestyles, and she's attracted to that. Here she is living in a not very great part of London and living with the person who is essentially her second choice for a husband. She's not happy with her life, right? Yeah, I mean, I don't even know if George Manning qualified as a second choice at this point. Um, Their marriage was in serious trouble by 1849. And by now, Maria had left him on more than one occasion. Uh, Later reports would claim that she pulled a knife on him. So they were quarreling uh, quite a bit. And especially toward the summer of 1849, money was really tight. Maria had tried to work as a dressmaker for a time, but that failed. And George really didn't have any steady work either. So she was in a marriage with a man she did not like at all. And she was basically kind of trapped in pestilential Bermondsey. So yeah, she found herself in a really undesirable situation, to put it mildly. Right, yeah. So... On August 9th of that year, she invites Patrick to dinner at her house with she and her husband, George. And it's kind of an odd scenario, right? Yeah. Former boyfriend and her husband. Yes. So, unfortunately, we have no idea whether they even ate on uh, the evening of August 9th. So that evening, as you say, Maria invites Patrick O'Connor to dine with her and George at their home at Three Miniver Place in Bermondsey. While Patrick O'Connor is on the way to this meal, he bumps into two friends of his on London Bridge. And they're like, oh, hey, Patrick, where, where are you off to? And he says, oh, I'm going to have dinner. See? And he actually produces a written invitation signed Maria and shows these two guys that he's on the way to have dinner with the Mannings. And this is about 5 p.m. in the evening. And this is not the last time that Patrick O'Connor is seen alive, but it is one of the last times that Patrick O'Connor is seen alive. By the next day, he has disappeared and nobody knows where he is. So when is the last time Patrick O'Connor is seen alive again? That is a really hard question to answer because... There's differing testimony from witnesses, and some of that testimony is unreliable. So the latest time that we have is about 5.45 p.m. uh, An acquaintance of O'Connor's claimed to have spotted him from atop an omnibus. So this guy was on top of an omnibus riding down the street, and he saw Patrick supposedly walking on the sidewalk. So originally, this witness said that he saw him at 5.45, but then later he changed his testimony to say that he saw him closer to 515. So probably it's around 515, between 5 and 515 are probably the last times that he was seen alive. So the next day, O'Connor's cousin grows concerned about him, right? And goes to the police. Exactly. So his cousin also works at the docks and Patrick O'Connor misses his shift that morning. He's like, this is unlike Patrick. Like he's usually on time for work. So yeah, he goes to the police and inquiries are made. Eventually they bump into these other guys who saw Patrick O'Connor crossing London bridge and heading to the Mannings and they learn where he was going. So soon they are rolling up to three men of her place and asking Maria Manning, hey, have you seen Patrick O'Connor? What's going on? Where has he gone? 
And she behaves extremely oddly during one of these interviews. Claims She claims that Patrick never stopped by for dinner on August 9th. And then she just out of nowhere <laughs> sort of moans, oh, Patrick, he was the greatest friend I had in London. And, you know, Patrick's cousin is sort of taken aback by this because it sounds strangely ominous, first of all. And second of all, it sounds a little bit fishy because it's as though Maria Manning knows that something terrible has befallen him. So they're left to wonder what what she knows and what might have happened to him. Yeah. And by August 12th, three days later, basically, both Maria and George Manning have skipped town. Yes, it's clear to them. The police are closing in. They're asking questions. On August 12th, Maria is spotted by neighbors loading a large white trunk into a cab and leaving. George actually finds out probably that same day that Maria has skipped town, and then he's gone by the next day. So yeah, that's obviously suspicious. It's it's not looking great for the Mannings at this point. <laughs> so two constables go to search the Manning home. Can you talk about that, how, th- how that search goes? Yeah, so as you, as you mentioned, the Mannings are looking extremely suspicious to the police. So two constables go over to Three Men of Her Place, and they start by kind of digging around the garden because they're thinking maybe they buried, his gar- his, maybe they buried Patrick O'Connor's body outside but they don't they don't turn up anything suspicious so they go inside they scour the ground floor nothing looks out of the ordinary so they go downstairs downstairs there are two kitchens one in the front and one in the back so they pass through the first of these and again nothing looks amiss then they pass into the back kitchen and things immediately look sketchy to them because they notice that it is conspicuously neat and tidy as though someone has just had it cleaned and it's like spick and span. So one of the police officers is looking around and he notices a kind of damp discoloration between two of the flagstones that are on the floor. So he kneels down, pulls out a clasp knife and pokes that spot with it. And he finds that it is very soft. And so for him, you know, a light bulb goes off and he's like, we are not leaving this house until we have taken up this flooring. And that's what they do. Um, They get various implements and they pull up the floor and they discover the body of Patrick O'Connor buried beneath the floor of this back kitchen. What was the condition of Patrick O'Connor's body? How had he been killed? So he was buried naked. And he was clearly shot in the head, and someone had also battered him with a crowbar also on the head. It was a very violent murder. So the Mannings, as we have established, had a pretty good head start. What methods did Scotland Yard use to track them? Yeah, so they were really worried about being able to find the Mannings, because as you said, they had a couple, they had a couple days head start at this point. And while the world had not yet celebrated the invention of the telephone, they did have the railway, right? So they could cover a lot of distance in a little time. And all they had to do was jump on a train to, say, Liverpool and then get on a steamship, and then they could be on their way to the United States. So they were worried that they, whether they would be able to catch up with them. However, what police could use was the telegraph, which had also been developed basically just over a decade earlier in 1837, although it wasn't really in in, in widespread use until the mid-1840s or so. So it was still quite newfangled. And immediately they start sending communications to every port city they can saying, hey, we're after two fugitives. Here's what they look like. Here's what they're suspected of. Let us know if you see anyone who matches this descri- these these descriptions. Um, So initially, yeah, they rely most heavily on the telegraph and the kind of instantaneous communication that it allowed. So they're not traveling together. Maria goes north. George goes south. Would you tell us the route Maria took, where she ended up and how she was ultimately found? Sure. I love this part of the story because it involves some ace police work. So basically... 
we were talking about how they were trying to use the telegraph to track down the Mannings, right? Well, actually, those efforts proved fruitless in the beginning of the hunt for the killers. What worked, however, was basically this this one policeman, I believe his name is Sergeant Shaw, just pounded the pavement. And they knew that Maria Manning had been seen leaving three men of her place and getting into a cab. So he's like, okay, I'm going to try and find that cabbie. So he just pounded the pavement and went from one cab driver to another and said, hey, did you give a ride to a woman who looks like this on August 12th? He did this for almost a full week without any success. He did not get any closer to tracking down Maria. However, finally, um, on August 20, 21st, he finds a cabbie named Kirk. And he's like, yes, I actually remember giving a ride to a woman who looks exactly like that. And I took her to what is now Houston Station. So this is the first major break in the case. And it's taken quite some time for the pol- police to get it, right? So another detective or another police officer goes to the train station and follows up on this lead. And they say, yes, actually, a woman answering that description bought a ticket to Edinburgh. And she actually bought a first class ticket on this train. And that will become important later. So we know at this point that Maria Manning has taken a train to Edinburgh. One thing that we also know is that after the discovery of O'Connor's body, police went to search his lodgings. And during this search, they determined that valuables had been stolen, including railway shares. So armed with the knowledge that Maria may be in Edinburgh, Scotland, the police use the telegraph and zap a communication up there, letting the police know to keep an eye out for her. This is at about 2.50 p.m. in the afternoon. Less than one hour later, (laughs) they get a communication back from Edinburgh saying, we already have her in custody. So here's how Maria got herself caught in Edinburgh. So she goes into the Edinburgh Royal Exchange and she has assumed the identity of Mrs. Smith. And she meets two bankers there and she gets into a conversation with them. And she says, oh, my gosh, I just arrived in Edinburgh. I love this place. I went swimming over in Portobello. What a lovely city. And the conversation turns to what has brought her to the bank that day. She says that she has railway shares uh, that she would like the bankers to sell. In addition, she has somewhere between three and five hundred pounds of money that she wants to invest in railway stock. So basically, the bankers say, okay, we're happy to help you. We'll see about getting these railway shares sold. So she hands over a certificate for those railway shares for them to keep hold of. And she also writes her name and Edinburgh address on a piece of paper and hands that over as well. And then she goes out. A day passes. Mrs. Smith comes back and she informs one of the bankers, that her mother has fallen ill and she's going to have to travel to Newcastle in England. It's all quite unexpected. Uh, And she asks if the banker would return this railway certificate that she presented the previous day. Says, okay, here you go. And as she's leaving, she says, oh, wait, you know, do, do you still have that slip of paper with my name and address on it? He looks for it and unfortunately, cannot find it. It's nowhere to be found at this time. She's clearly disappointed by this development, but she turns and leaves the bank. So a day or two later, the bankers get a communication from the police saying, railway shares are known to have been stolen in London. Keep an eye out for them. Don't do business with anyone who has these railway shares. So the banker's suspicions immediately fall on Mrs. Smith because it struck them as very odd for her to be so gung-ho about having these railway shares sold and then coming back and picking up the certificate. Her her behavior had also been odd when she said that she needed to go take care of her mother. It just seemed quite insincere to them. So they considered her quite sketchy and one of the bankers has a bright idea. He says, oh my God, tucked away somewhere 
in this bank is that slip of paper with her name and address on it. So he searches high and low again, and this time it turns up. And so once he has this in hand, he goes to the police and they're able to track uh, Maria Manning down to her current lodgings. And that's where they place her under arrest. So do you have any guesses as to why she went back to the bank and asked for the certificate back? I think she just wanted to have that railway certificate with her in her possession in case she needed to get out of Dodge again. Um, And I don't think she wanted anyone to know where she was staying. Uh, That's part of why she went back to go get that slip of paper with her name and address on it. So I think she was trying just to be cautious. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So once Marie was caught, that left George, of course, right? Yes. So... There's an important discovery here because when they arrest Maria, they find that she's alone. And actually, up until this point, the police weren't sure really 100% whether Maria and George were traveling together or separately. So at this point, they're like, oh boy, we have the what? We have Mrs. Manning, but we are we don't have Mr. Manning here. So the search is ongoing. So about a week after Maria's arrest, someone tips off the police that she has seen George Manning aboard a ship bound for the Isle of Jersey, which is in the English Channel. Again, this is about a week after Maria has been taken into police custody. And then police are able to follow this lead and visit Jersey. And... (laughs) they make inquiries around town and it turns out that there is a very suspicious newcomer to the island. It's a very close-knit community, right? Everybody knows everybody. They know when someone shows up out of nowhere. And George had not done a great job of keeping a low profile. He drank a bottle of brandy every single day and was quite irascible and obnoxious, frankly, when drunk. So (laughs) he had made quite a few enemies (laughs) during his brief stay (laughs) on Jersey. And he also had some kind of strange habits. So for example, he stayed at a residence called Prospect House. And when he went for strolls in the garden, he would pull his felt hat down over his face as if he wanted to avoid recognition. So he just seemed like a shady character to everyone. And people had read about what was called the Bermondsey Horror, the murder of Patrick O'Connor on Jersey. And they started to suspect that that this guy was involved. So anyway, the police show up at Prospect House where George Manning was known to have taken lodgings and they creep up the stairs and they go straight into his room and they find him basically asleep in bed. It was at 9 or 10 p.m. And they just leap on top of him and take him into custody. And that was that. And he was almost relieved, right? When they finally caught him. Yes, he was almost relieved. I think the strain of you know, being on the lam had really gotten to him. So the police arrested both Mannings. They're questioned. And each react to police differently. Uh, Maria is composed. She only talks when she has to. She seems very deliberate in her interactions with her inquisitors. George, on the other hand, readily blabs. Oh, yes. And is happy to place all of the blame on her. Immediately, as soon as he's arrested, he is relieved partly because, again, the stress of being on the land, but also because he cheerfully points the finger at his wife and accuses her of planning the murder and carrying it out. He says that he was as innocent as a lamb. It's a direct quote. And police are like, you realize by telling us that you're actually implicating yourself because you're you're implicitly saying that you knew the crime had been committed and did nothing to alert us until we placed you under arrest, which is not a good look. So yeah, it, it was not the wisest strategy on George's part. And as you said, Maria Manning says nothing about the death of Patrick O'Connor to the police, and this will be important later. She hardly ever speaks during early public appearances. She, she only answers questions when she needs to. And usually she she says things like, I'm going to let my attorney take care of this. So she she more or less stays silent about the whole crime. Do you have any idea uh, about how they split the money? She had the certificates and, as you've said, hundreds of pounds. Was he found with the kind of money she was found with? Do you know? I'm not 100% sure, but 
a lot of people were curious about this issue with the money. And this is a completely bizarre hypothesis that does not really bear scrutiny. But some people speculated that because Maria had taken the lion's share of all this money, she had actually planned to murder O'Connor and then betray her husband all along and run away with all the winnings that she could. But yeah, George was was left without nearly as much money. I don't think there was any agreement as to as to how to share the money. Maria really ran off with the largest portion of it. And she was more than happy, frankly, to ditch George Manning at this point. <laughs> so they were tried together, but they each had their own attorneys, right? Yeah, this was pretty ugly business, to be honest. So they're tried jointly. Um, and instead of sort of like working a- together to defend themselves against the charges that were brought by the Crown, they had separate attorneys <laughs> and It was almost like this domestic dispute that was playing out by proxy because George's solicitor basically argues that, hey, my client says that Maria Manning, the other defendant, committed this murder, so he's innocent. And then Maria Manning's solicitor was like, okay, there's all the only evidence that we have to suggest that came from your client. There's nothing else to support that. And also, it's just not very chivalrous for a husband to throw his wife under the bus like this. So shame on you what a scoundrel George Manning is. And all of this was playing <laughs> out in the court, right? So it was just a really awkward, ugly affair. Right. There, there was definitely circumstantial evidence, but nothing to actually connect her to the murder. But, but George, right, he had actually been seen by someone that night, I, I think in their backyard. Yes. So this is a really important point. We have to say up front that we do not know when Patrick O'Connor showed up for dinner, and we do not know when he was murdered. Those are giant question marks that hang over the entire case, and we will just never know how exactly he met his death. So we do know that Patrick O'Connor was seen heading to the Mannings' house at about 5 p.m. He wasn't there yet. There's also a witness who testified to seeing George Manning sitting on the garden wall smoking a pipe at about 6.45 p.m. So we know that he was there that night. He was at Three Men of Her Place, the crime scene. Nobody ever saw Maria Manning at the crime scene that night. And quite the contrary, somebody saw her very far away from the crime scene. So at 5.45, O'Connor's landlady receives a visit from Maria at O'Connor's lodgings. And and Maria shows up and says, hey, I want to speak to Patrick O'Connor. Is he here? And his landlady says, no, he's gone out. And Maria Manning's like, okay, I'll just hang out. So this is again at 5.45. She goes upstairs to Patrick O'Connor's lodgings and just kind of hangs out there until about 7.15. So she's there for roughly an hour and a half. And Patrick O'Connor's lodgings are a 45-minute walk away from Three Men of Her Place. Although, you know, she could have gotten there more quickly if she took, say, an omnibus or a cab. But we just don't know how she got there. So there's this big black box where... Maria is away from the crime scene for at least an hour and a half, and then she has to get back there. Maria's defense attorney laid out this potential timeline. So sometime around five o'clock, O'Connor has not yet shown up for dinner, at which point Maria leaves three men of her place and goes looking for him. So she goes to his lodgings and she gets there by about 545. She waits there for an hour and a half. He hasn't shown up, so she leaves and goes back to three men of her place. Then, when she comes home, she arrives to find O'Connor already dead, meaning that George actually killed him. This theory is plausible, but we have no way of proving it. Um, But it is a theory that Maria's attorney floated in court. So you said he was shot, and either of them could have done that. But then he was physically assaulted. Was there debate about that, whether that was something that she could have done, or was it assumed 
George had done, the, the, the physical attack? Well, I think there was honestly just a lot of skeptical that almost had nothing to do with the concept of physical strength, but rather with the concept of femininity and what women were thought capable of doing. So actually, when the Crown brought these charges, they said they were trying to prove that George Manning had fired the pistol and actually committed the murder. They also wanted to try and prove that Maria Manning was present at the time of the homicide, but may have just aided and abetted. She was present, but she had not fired the gun and she had not inflicted any of the wounds with this crowbar because it it seemed unthinkable to them that a woman would commit murder. Women were at this, you know, Victorian London was an extremely patriarchal society. They did not consider women capable of that kind of brutal violence. That seemed like a kind of masculine trait to observers at the time. Now, the question of who fired the pistol and who inflicted those head wounds with the crowbar did recur throughout the investigation. So George, from the beginning, said that Maria Manning invited Patrick O'Connor down to the kitchen and then shot him. That's what he said from the beginning, but he basically remained silent as to the wounds inflicted with that crowbar. Later, just before his execution, he actually made a a different confession in which he still maintained that Maria had fired the pistol on O'Connor, but then he said that he had gone downstairs and inflicted those head wounds with the crowbar because he had never much liked Patrick O'Connor. Right. Yeah. So it's an, it's an extremely difficult case with a lot of potential timelines and a lot of ambiguity as to who could have inflicted which wounds But yeah, I think it is important to state and stress that there was a real possibility that Maria Manning was not even at home at the time of the murder. Personally, my gut, it's so hard to say, my gut tells me that, I mean, it's a he said, she said situation, right? And there's just no evidence either way. So Maria Manning was arrested about a week before police captured George Manning, right? So she was taken to prison. And in the meantime, she talked with prison guards about developments in the case. And when she heard that George had been captured, she was like, what what has he said? And one of the prison guards said to her, he accused you of committing the murder. And then she said, the villain, it was him that did it, not I. So... (laughs) Um, This was not a public statement, right? Um, Because I remember earlier I said in public she had made no statements whatsoever about the crime, but it is uh, one statement that sort of leaked to the public by way of this prison guard who talked to reporters. So you basically have George Manning saying that Maria Manning did it, and then you have Maria Manning saying that George Manning did it. And there's really no evidence to support, there's no concrete evidence to support either version of events. I do, it does seem possible to me that Maria came home and found Patrick O'Connor already dead. I mean, it it seems like a really strong possibility to me. So with all of this conflict between the Mannings, was there ever an attempt by either of them, by their attorneys, to have them tried separately? Yes. What I can say here, there's a, there's a lot of interesting legal questions. So Maria's attorney actually wanted to get her a separate trial if he could. And he thought he could get this because Maria was born in Switzerland. And there was actually a medieval statute, statute from under the reign of King Edward III that stipulated basically that Aliens charged with charged with crimes on English soil were entitled to a mixed jury. That jury would consist 50% of native English people and 50% of foreigners. George Manning was English by birth, so he had he was not entitled 
to a mixed jury. And so Maria's attorney was saying was trying to say, I want her tried separately because she is entitled to this mixed jury and George Manning is not. And he knew that if he could get Maria tried separately, then George Manning's accusation could not be admitted as evidence against her because it was, you know, husbands could not be compelled to testify against their wives. Now, unfortunately, this was a pretty crafty maneuver, but it fell through because get this. I mean, this, there are so many twists and turns. So he, he was making a pretty strong case. But in 1848, one year before this murder took place, a new law went on the books saying that foreign born women who married English citizens also became English citizens as soon as they married. And so they actually had to stop the trial at the beginning and debate this point. They're like, well, does Maria Manning, should she actually have a trial with a mixed jury? And they came back and said, no, because she has married George Manning and the right to a trial by mixed jury was attached to her status as a foreigner. And her status as a foreigner fell away as soon as she married George Manning. So that's part of why they were tried jointly. It's so bizarre, too, because, again, there was some circumstantial evidence that didn't look great for Maria Manning, but the only evidence they had to put her at three men of her place at the time of the crime was George's testimony. And that was admitted during the trial because that was actually implicating of George, right? Because he was saying, I knew a crime had taken place and I didn't do anything to notify the police. So even though George's accusations that Maria Manning had committed this murder were admitted in court, the judge basically had to tell the jury, you actually cannot think of this testimony as inculpating Maria Manning, even though he has accused Maria Manning of committing the crime. You can't think of it that way because George is her husband. So you can only think of it as evidence against George. (laughs) So it's, yeah, yeah. Wow. Very interesting. Yeah. So she stayed quiet during the trial for the most part, but once she was found guilty, she sprung up from her chair and began loudly proclaiming her innocence. Yes. Do you think her outburst was the result of shock? Or or did the bad news just kind of make her feel like she had nothing to lose? She could finally say out loud what she had been thinking since her arrest. I think she was absolutely shocked and outraged that she was found guilty. And I think she was right to feel that way because, again, there was no legitimate evidence tying her to the scene of the crime at the time of the murder. I mean, and George George Manning's testimony was obviously self-serving and unreliable. Uh, she thought that she would really get off. Yeah, so she had remained more or less silent up until this point in court. And when the verdict comes down, she just loses it and just castigates everyone in the courtroom, everyone. Like, The judge is rattled. She's like, there's no law. There's no justice here. This is a complete travesty. (laughs) Um, And (laughs) she sits down and the judge puts on the ceremonial black cap that is traditionally worn when judges are passing the death sentence. And he gets ready to, to sentence them to death formally. And then Maria goes for it again. She just gets up and just rails against the judge, the court, everyone. Everyone is stunned. And then finally, she kind of shocks everyone again with this parting gesture. So uh, she and George were both sitting in the dock. And customarily, an attendant would sprinkle sprigs of rue in front of the prisoners. Rue is an herb with medicinal properties. And it was thought to be able to slow the spread of jail fever or typhus. So The idea was that um, prisoners would pick up typhus in jail and then transmit it to the public by coming to court. And they wanted to stop that by placing sprigs of this herb in front of, of the prisoners. So Maria picks up a handful of this rue and just throws it into the courtroom. Just complete, unadulterated contempt for the entire gathering. And everyone was just speechless. So public sentiment... It wasn't really on her side after this, right? If there had been 
positive feelings by anybody towards her up to this point, this outburst really turned people off. Yes. Um, yeah. I, again, it struck a lot of Victorians as inappropriate for a, for a woman um, because women were thought to be meek and submissive and so on and so forth. So for one, just to rail against a male judge and most of the people in court, the lawyers, they were all men. It was considered completely out of line at the time. So yes, public sentiment had really turned against her in some regards. A lot of observers condemned her behavior, but at the same time, she had made this dramatic spectacle in the courtroom and people were just obsessed. They couldn't stop talking about her. So it was a, um, and again, she also wore these black satin dresses that looked really great. So there was a mixture of revulsion on the one hand and attraction on the other because there was something glamorous about her. And this was interesting, right? That Madame Tussaud was actually in the courtroom sketching the Mannings. She is said to have gone to the courtroom to make sketches of the criminals. Yeah. So we'll get to Tussaud in a minute, I guess. But she always prided herself on the accuracy of her wax effigies. And so she claimed to go to either homicide trials or public executions specifically so that she can make sketches of the perpetrators to ensure that she really delivered the goods when she created um, their wax likenesses. So tell us about November 13th, 1849, the execution of the Mannings. It was on the rooftop of a South London jail, right? Yes. So the execution took place on the roof of Horsemonger Lane Jail in South London. And thousands of people were expected to attend. Public executions at this point in time were sort of a morbid form of popular entertainment. Uh, whenever a, a new crime sort of caught the public imagination, people would go out to watch the murderer, or in this case, convicted murderers, hang at the gallows. So thousands of people. I mean, the Mannings had just shocked the nation, and there was expected to be a really huge turnout. And we know, we have a good idea of what went down, partly thanks to Charles Dickens, because Charles Dickens had gotten interested in this case. And he hit the streets at about midnight. The execution was supposed to happen shortly after daybreak. And he had taken steps to reserve, actually, an observation post specifically for watching this execution. Because so many people would go to these executions. Most of them would hang out on the street down below. And they would crane their necks upward so that they could see what was happening on the roof overhead. Those are sort of ordinary people. However, Londoners with more money could pay for seats, basically. And that is part of what, that's what Charles Dickens did. So he and four friends basically pooled their money so they could buy seats on a rooftop, and they also reserved a back kitchen. So he attends the Manning's execution, and he's kind of down on the street at around midnight, just taking the social temperature, seeing what people are up to. Then he goes up. Uh, to the roof. And he really goes to this ex execution expressly to watch the crowd. He does not want to watch the hanging itself. He wants to watch all the people who show up and how they respond to it. So as the hours tick by, we get closer to daybreak. Thousands and thousands and thousands of people show up. An estimated 30,000 people are thought to have come to watch this, ex this execution. And that's all basically in one street, right? So you have to imagine this gigantic crowd at the base of this prison. And <laughs> they're basically making holiday down there. They're singing songs, just having a blast. And of course, there are criminals circulating in the crowd as well. So you have pickpockets uh, and other ruffians. Um, the, there's a police presence to try and keep order. And then finally... Daybreak comes, all eyes turn upward up to the gallows, and we see George and Maria Manning come out, and we have a very good description of what exactly Maria Manning looked like in her last moments. So um, Charles Dickens watched or attended this execution in the company of another writer named John Forrester, 
He says that, as per usual, Maria Manning was beautifully dressed. And, you know, throughout this entire process had exuded a kind of firmness, um, a steeliness. Uh, and that was part of why Londoners found her so compelling, right? Think of when she just stood up in the courtroom and let the judge have it. She hit the s- extremely self-possessed today on the gallows as well and walked to walked up the walked up the scaffold the walked up the scaffold as though she were going to a feast in the words of John Forrester and he even claims that after the trapdoor was thrown and she dropped and died that she looked beautiful in death so that's what John Forrester claims so yeah there was a giant spectacle at the execution Charles Dickens is absolutely horrified by what he sees and he sends a letter to the editors of the Times of London. And he basically calls for the immediate abolition of public executions because he considers them to have this kind of barbarizing effect on the crowd. The crowd had behaved so ghoulishly in the lead up to the hanging and they had shown such brutal mirth, to quote him. They're almost kind of devilish in the pleasure that they reaped from this spectacle. So he he calls for the abolition of public executions in favor of uh, hangings that are carried out within prison walls. So basically, he wants to make it so no one can go watch them. And this ignites a giant debate among the press uh, about the ethics and utility of capital punishment. It's actually one of the, like the most fiery debates about this issue that they had carried out in recent years. Wow. Uh, So soon after the execution, the state appointed hangman William Kelcraft was paid for their clothing, correct? Yes. So, yeah, this is wild. So I mentioned a few minutes ago that Madame Tussaud always prided herself on the accuracy of her handiwork. Well, she also wanted to give it a certain authenticity as well. And so what she would do is after the celebrated murderers, after celebrated murderers were hanged, she would send a representative to William Calcraft. The murderer's last effects became his property and he could do with it as he wanted. So what he would do is sell the clothes that the criminals had worn in court to Madame Tussaud's wax museum. And then what would they do with those clothes? They would dress the wax effigies in them. So the wax sculptures that people saw at the Chamber of Horrors were actually wearing clothes that had touched the skin of, in this case, George Manning and Maria Manning. And it seems that he sold one of Maria Manning's famous black satin gowns to Tussauds. So this kind of starts another debate in the press, right? These are two well-known, notorious figures, convicted murderers, and now it appears as though Madame Tussaud is about to capitalize on, commercialize the murder of Patrick O'Connor. Yeah. One thing that I talk about in this season of The Art of Crime is that Victorians were just as crazy about true crime as we are. As you can tell, there was constant press coverage of the hunt for the Mannings and the Bermondsey horror, but they also kind of debated the ethics of consuming true crime as entertainment, which is something that we do today as well. And there was a pretty ferocious ethical debate um, about the treatment of the Mannings in the press. Some critics basically took issue with what they saw as the glorification of murderers, right? These should be treated as the scum of the earth. They had kind of violated the most basic moral imperative that it is wrong to take another's life in cold blood, right? That's horrible. And yet you had this obsession with especially Maria Manning. And in fact, people were even comparing her to famous actresses um, who gave show-stopping performances in theater, right? Um, she, She had an association with the character of Lady Macbeth from Shakespeare's tragedy Macbeth. It's like one of his most famous characters. She's absolutely ferocious. And yeah, so people were starting to view her as something akin to a star actress almost who had given this this unbelievable performance first at the Old Bailey um, with her tirades and then again atop the roof of Horsemonger Lane Jail. 
And critics also took issue with entertainment venues like the Chamber of Horrors because Madame Tussaud was capitalizing on this obsession with notorious criminals. And they wrote, I mean, they really took Tussaud to task in the press for this. Right. Yeah. So how long would their statues be displayed? Do you know? Years and years and years and years. They were around for decades. This was a famous, it was like a crime of the century. You know, it was like up there. Um, So there were, um, their statues were definitely there in the 1880s. I believe the, the statue of Maria Manning still exists, though I'm uncertain of whether it's on display. Would we recognize the names of any of the the other criminals sharing space with the Mannings in the Chamber of Horrors? Have you covered Burke and Hare on this show? Yes. Yes, we have. Yes. So Burke and Hare um, were in the Chamber of Horrors. You also might have heard of the assassination of Jean-Paul Marat. So Mm -hmm. he is... We dedicate an entire episode to the assassination of Jean-Paul Marat in this season of The Art of Crime. Um, So as you probably know, he was stabbed to death in his bath by Charlotte Corday, an assassin. And Tussaud actually, this of course happened when Tussaud was still in Paris, which is where she started out. After that, she actually made a tableau that depicted Marat dead in his bath, you know, with one arm kind of dangling over the edge of the bathtub. And it became like one of the most famous works of art in her entire collection for years and years and years and years. So she took it with her when she left Paris for London in 1802. She took it on the road with her when she traveled um, the English provinces and Ireland and Scotland, which took place over the course of 30 years. And then she still had it when she settled down in London in the mid-1830s. So Jean-Paul Marat was there in the Chamber of Horrors. There were also replicas of severed heads from the French Revolution, from the Reign of Terror. So there was a death head of Maximilien Robespierre, who was one of the great proponents of the Reign of Terror, of course. Later. After Tussaud's death in the 1860s, uh, her sons, so this was a family business we were dealing with, her sons added uh, wax replicas of the severed heads of both Marie Antoinette and King Louis XVI. Um, So they were not criminals, of course, but they were victims of the bloodshed of the French Revolution. And I'm trying to think of other criminals that you might know of have you covered Francois Courvoisier? No, no. Nope. So he was a Swiss valet who slashed his master's throat and then robbed him in 1840. And Charles Dickens actually attended his execution as well and was appalled by what he saw at that point too. There's actually kind of a funny connection between Francois Courvoisier and Maria Manning because both of them were Swiss. And so, you know... <laughs> 19th century journalistic standards were pretty low. A lot of reporters kind of speculated in the early days of the hunt for the Mannings that there was some relationship between Francois Courvoisier and Maria Manning simply because they were both Swiss. So Francois Courvoisier was another huge kind of crime of the century. I think even as many as 40,000 people turned out to watch his execution. So the crowd was even bigger at Curvoisier's hanging than it was at Manning's nine years later. Huh. Yeah. Fascinating. One thing I should tell you. So in 1849, maybe there weren't other a ton of other criminals that you might know about, but the Chamber of Horrors still exists to this day. And recently, they made a controversial decision to add an effigy of Jack the Ripper. And this, of course, was controversial because the mystery is never solved. Like, we just we have not come to a definitive solution about who committed those murders. And Tussaud always prided herself on the accuracy of her handiwork, right? Well, how can you create an accurate wax likeness of a murderer if you don't know who that murderer was and what he looked like? So is it the traditional Jack the Ripper character with the black top hat, cape, medical bag? I believe they modeled it on Aaron Kosminski. Okay. Who is, uh, you know, supposedly there's DNA evidence linking him to the Whitechapel murders. Yeah, I, I did a 
Kuzminski episode a couple of months ago. So yeah, uh, definitely one of the leading suspects. I know you told me that there was a bunch of Jack the River material coming up when we first um, talked. Communicated. Yes. Well, this has been great. A really intriguing case. Great story. And as you've mentioned, for anyone listening who wants to learn more about Madame Tussauds, Colorful Life, your third season of the Art of Crime podcast is in full swing. And it's all about Madame Tussauds in the Chamber of Horrors. So where should we direct people who want to find out more about you and your show? Oh, well, you can subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Yeah, so The Art of Crime is available on all all the, the regular podcasting platforms. Um, you should definitely also check out the Art of Crime website, which is www.artofcrimepodcast.com. There's lots of images and uh, full transcripts on there. It's worth checking out, I think. And yeah, I'd say that's about it. Well, thank you, Gavin. It's been fun talking to you. Thanks again for having me. I've had a blast. Again, I have been speaking to Gavin Whitehead. The third season of his history podcast, The Art of Crime, is available wherever podcasts are listened to. This has been another episode of the Most Notorious Podcast, broadcasting to every dark and cobwebbed corner of the world. I'm Eric Rivenis, and have a safe tomorrow. <laughs>